in a couple of minutes we can start letting people in and then of course there have to be people who want to get in <laughs> for us to let them in and then and then i'll start and i'll go live right at the hour Is that a, a decent sized font, by the way? Is it easy to read or is it uh, all the stuff over here? It is for me, but. Yeah, it's good for me too. I can, uh, we can get wacky if we want to, for example. <laughs> I don't know if that's much better. That's worse. Yeah. yeah. Dracula. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's something you can also let me know as well if I, I can make change the volume of the of what's going on or, or change the font as well. Or size of the font. I'm drinking uh, lemon ginger echinacea mimosa. <laughs> try it sometime yeah, that should uh, works wonders against coronavirus I <laughs> yeah, exactly. this is this is what's kept me safe in New York yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah. okay I'm gonna start admitting people into the zoom so they won't be able to unmute but they'll be able to hear okay. you and then in two minutes I can start flooding yeah or as people come in. I'm going to start taking us live and I'll let you know when we are ready to go. Okay. James, if you just want to keep admitting people in while I'm oh, doing okay. this, that would be great. Oh. I'm not sure what to... oh, I see.
my computer is getting tired of working so hard over these <laughs> last few months. Zooming around. Okay, we're live. All right, everybody, welcome to this uh, session. Bienvenue à cet atelier avec Michael McCormick. Uh, we're going to keep letting people trickle in as things started, but it is three o'clock, so we're going to get underway. Um, moi, je suis James O'Callaghan. Je suis un membre du Conseil National du CLC, CC, the Canadian League of Composers. I'm a composer uh, representing the Quebec region, uh, but I'm a little bit all over right now. I'm in New York. Um, and uh, the CLC, if you don't know much about it, uh, is a really important uh, and exciting organization that advocates for composers in Canada, setting things like uh, the fees that uh, composers get professionally, um, advocating for equity and opportunities for composers to have access, uh, making professional development for composers through these new initiatives um, that we're doing now as part of that. Uh, if you want to check out more about what we do and become a member, if you're not already, please visit our website at composition.org. Um, I'm going to do a quick uh, land acknowledgement, which is kind of a funny thing to do in the virtual domain, but uh, I think it's important, uh, a nice ritual to um, always reflect when we get together in the spaces that we're in to think about where we are and the systems of power that have let us be where we are. So for me right now, I'm in uh, New York City, which is the traditional territory of Algonquin people, particularly the Lenape. And uh, um, it's just a moment for you to reflect on where you are in the world and uh, what is permitting you to be there and the ongoing systems of uh, oppression that might be um, happening in your area. Uh, so I'm going to quickly get out of the way and let Mike uh, take the show here and talk to us about creative co coding and super collider. But uh, si jamais vous avez des questions, uh, sentez à l'aise de les poser dans le chat Zoom ici ou sur Facebook. Um, uh, if you ever have questions, uh, please write them in the Zoom chat or on Facebook Live. We're going to be monitoring the questions uh, uh, en français ou en anglais. Um, anytime I will interrupt if necessary in order to uh, rally these questions as Mike is presenting, but uh, otherwise I'm just going to take a step back and uh, let Mike take the lead. Thanks for coming. Merci d'être là. Thanks so much for the introduction, James, uh, and thanks everyone uh, for for joining me uh, this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are. I uh, I'm really excited to talk about Super Collider, which is a programming language or environment uh, designed specifically for musicians. Uh, whether you're working as a composer, or performer, or if you want to do analysis uh, with music you can you can use this language to to in a, in a wide variety of ways it's, it's very flexible um, I'm going to present a few ways today uh, how to use the language to um, maybe more in a fixed media uh, or generative algorithmic composition uh, uh, direction but um, there's not enough time in the day to sort of present all the things that are possible with the software. So I had to pick a few things, but hopefully I can sort of inspire you to uh, explore some of the other opportunities, uh, the, the other uh, possibilities that are available with this, this software. Uh, if you have installed the software on your computer, uh, fantastic. You can open it up and code along with me. Uh, I'm going to do my best to explain everything I'm doing as, as we go through it uh, and there'll be some sound examples uh, 
just many of them are sort of il illustrative, but we can also uh, hopefully we can sort of use our imaginations to go beyond what I'm what I'm doing today. Uh, first up, uh, these are some links uh, and resources you can download the software from here, for example. These are some other links where you can find uh, tutorials or you can find um, there's the community, for example, forums, the Facebook group. This is a great uh, YouTube series of tutorials that is, uh, I highly recommend. Um, my intention today is not to get anybody learning the software, just inspired, and hopefully you can, for example, go afterwards to Eli Fieldsteel's tutorial and check it out, or go to the forum and, and sort of uh, become part of the community. Um, I want to get through a lot today, so if I'm moving too fast, just let me know. And feel free to ask questions to clarify things. I'm going to try and build on knowledge as we go. So um, I recognize that there's, there, you know, I don't want to lose anybody in, in the, uh, on the way. Uh, hopefully you can all see this, my desktop here, which is the Super Collider IDE which stands for, I think, Integrated Development Environment. It doesn't matter. But we have a text editor here where we write our code. We have a help window. Sorry, Mike, I'm just going to interrupt you here. We have a yeah. question about uh, whether you can copy paste the address uh, into the chat field. Sure. Um, uh, and yeah. Actually, what while I'm, I'm at it, I'm just going to stop you to say that I forgot to. I just chat, wrote it in the chat, but I forgot to introduce, introduce you in um, greater detail. So just to say that for people who don't know Mike McCormick, he's a really wonderful composer, guitarist, uh, media artist, and uh, obviously a big expert in Super Collider, who's from Yellowknife and is based in Oslo. So apologies for not uh, giving you some clarification about our wonderful host. But, uh, <laughs> yes. No problem. I, I was actually I, I was going to mention a few things that I, I come from actually a performer background. I have a a background as a jazz guitarist, education as a jazz guitarist, and since then I've I've gotten into instrumental composition and electroacoustic composition, and um, I started working with Super Collider in 2014, and was I think within a year or so was using it for performances and installations and things. So it's the learning curve might be a bit steep at the beginning, but it it's just like learning any new tool or instrument. Um, if you stick with it, there's there's gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, I just made a note here that all of the notes that I'm going to write here uh, are going to be published at this address here, uh, which is an online repository for code. Um, this I can actually post, for example, in the chat, I think. There it is. Um, and for example, you can also screenshot things as we're going uh, if you want to save them for later. Um, but this, everything that I write here will be, everything that I write this afternoon will be, will be saved here. Um, yeah, so we have the text editor here. This is, I'll just sort of break down how Super Collider works in a general sense. Super Collider has a, this uh, interface with a text editor over here where we write our code. It has a help browser here where we can search for documentation to answer questions or figure out what error messages mean. And we have a post window. In the post window, when we execute code, the post window gives us feedback about what, we've, what kind of program we're running. Um, we can use it to find problems in our code, or we can use it to get feedback if we're, um, uh, you know, if we're, we're calculating something or analyzing uh, incoming sound or something, we can send that information to the post window so we can, we can read it. Um, for those of you coding along, uh, the two sort of most important key, uh, key commands that you'll need are evaluating code and especially stopping sound. Um, it's happened to me several times that I'm doing synthesis experiments and something blows up or you create a feedback loop and on a Mac it's command period and I think alt period is for Windows and Linux systems. But that's a good one to get used to doing just in case you um, put in a 10 instead of a 1 somewhere. 
Um, there is also, later when we start making sound, there is, I'll remind you as well, that you can turn down the volume. There's sort of a master volume here. If you click on this number, uh, these numbers here, which will be green in a minute, you can uh, reduce your volume. It doesn't work right now, but I'll, I'll remind you in a minute. Uh, and the other evaluating code is, I think, on Mac, or on, sorry, on Windows and Linux is Control Enter, and it's Command Return on Mac. Um, and the documentation, this help documentation, is accessible. I'm not sure if this is the Windows and Linux command. I'm just sort of guessing. But for Mac, it's Command D. So if I write something like filter, and I go Command D, uh, it will find the filter help page. And this I'll be doing often to sort of illustrate some things about Super Collider off uh, now and again, but just in case you know you can't see my fingers on the keyboard, so that's that's how I'm opening that up. Um, uh, this speaking of help pages, whoops. Uh, actually, it's server. Let me see here. Server versus client versus server. This is the help page I'm looking for. So this is just a little graphic that helps to maybe explain how Super Collider works a little bit. We have the audio server, which is hosted locally. So this is the thing that makes sound. This is the, um, this is the part of Super Collider that does all the audio processing. And it doesn't have anything to do with the programming language. Uh, we use the language to send messages to the audio server. Uh, and there's a few reasons for this, this architecture. One of the reasons is that if um, the server crashes, you can use the language to start it up again. You can also have the server on another computer across the world and send language to it. Uh, you can send commands from other languages like Python or JavaScript. Um, this is an in For me, I think this is an interesting help file to read to get an idea of the overall architecture of, of the um, of the software, but I just sort of mentioning this briefly because I will talk a lot about we're sending this to the server or whatever. This is a language approach or whatever. So don't uh, I realize I'm throwing a lot of new terms and, and new uh, new uh, concepts out here. So don't don't be. Uh, it's very natural to get uh, uh, to be hearing a lot of new information. Uh, first, what I'm going to show you is just a few common characters that we use in this programming language. So all, everything I've written up here so far is a comment. These things, uh, this part of the language doesn't turn in any, it doesn't get uh, interpreted as code. Uh, these are just notes for us humans to read. So often I'll, I'll, you know, I'll write a function or you'll make a synthesizer and then you'll write a note as a comment beside it to remember what it does or how it works. Uh, these curly braces are blocks of code. Uh, sorry, the parentheses are blocks of code. Curly braces are functions. Uh, and the square brackets are arrays. Uh, again, you don't have to memorize this. I'm just going to be using these words a lot. So just as a sort of glossary, we'll, we'll build it up slowly here. We have integers, which are any number, for example. Um, we have floating point numbers, which are anything with a decimal. And you see, if I if I evaluate this this line of code by pressing Command, I'm on a Mac, so I'll Command Return. The post window returns what I've evaluated, 130. Great. And if I evaluate a floating point, it it uh, returns the, the 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 decimal point as well. And this is an important concept in, in computing. It has to do with memory storage and whatever. And the implication for us is that if we're using numbers to control things like oscillators or frequencies or durations, there's a difference between uh, if I go 10.rand, if I use this method to perform an action on the number 10, this is going to choose a random number between 0 and 9. And uh, every time I evaluate it, it's going to pick a new number. If I do the same thing with a floating point number, we get random numbers between 0 and 10 with decimal points. And maybe I can make this a bit bigger. 
Um, so these are both, these are just sort of very simple concepts that, that have, can sometimes have big implications if we're making, um, you know, if we're panning to discrete speakers, we, we want to use integers, for example. Or if we are using uh, frequencies, we want to use floating points if we're, um, if we're using equal temperament, for example. Um, yeah. I'm going to talk a little bit about arrays because these are also something uh, that will, whoops, uh, arrays are used to store types of information, usually numbers, they can also store words or other objects, but it's within these square brackets, we can put uh, whatever we want basically, and by assigning it the name X, I can uh, recall things from this storage container later on. Um, so for example, if I put in the number 0, 1, 2, 3, separated by commas, uh, now I, and I evaluate it, now I have this object. And if I want to remove, or if I want to call on a, a part of that, uh, one of the slots in the array, I can go, whoops, x2. And in arrays, we always, and most of the things in Super Collider start from an index of 0. So instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, this would be 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, so this is calling the second item in this array. Uh, and the great thing about arrays, if we have, for example, scales, or we have rhythms, or we have any sort of information, we can do uh, all sorts of interesting um, uh, operations on them. So I can scramble all the contents in there, as you see here in the post window. And I can do this every time, and it'll give me pseudo-random scrambling. Uh, this becomes useful, we'll see later on. Uh, there's a reason I'm, I'm presenting all these things. Uh, another thing we can do is iteration. So we can iterate through all the things in the array. And I can say do, oops, Inside that array, on each of the elements in the array, I want you to do this particular operation. And what I'm going to do is say the first, each, uh, this is a function that it's going to do on every item in the array. And what it, it gets passed, we say two arguments. That's what the arg stands for. And the first argument is the item, and the second argument is the index. So I'm going to, to make this a bit clearer, I'm going to use the numbers four, five, six, seven. Uh, and what I'm going to do is uh, on each one of those items in this array called X, I want you to print the item and print the index. So if I evaluate this line in the post window, I get the item 4 and the index 0. Uh, what you write inside these curly braces inside this function can basically be anything. So I could do major transformations of these numbers. I could compare them to other numbers or to other other arrays, other data. Um, you could have um, analysis things going on where you're, you know, if uh, sorry, conditional statements where you have an analysis coming in, and if uh, the amplitude is above this threshold, then do this, for example. Uh, we'll look at this a bit later, but this is uh, arrays are very powerful and, and we'll use them a lot. So that's I just wanted to make a brief inter introduction of what we'll be seeing. Another thing we'll be seeing a lot uh, in Super Collider, you can um, name we, we we give names to things. We can do this by uh, writing symbols, which look like this. Uh, you can also write symbols like this. It's this different syntax, but those are the same. Uh, they have the same, they're equivalent. Um, and we also have strings, which are written with uh, double quotation marks. And these are both different kinds of names. The, the difference between them is subtle and not so important for today. But uh, we won't probably see too many strings, but symbols we'll see a lot of. And these are, you can think of them as names for synthesizers or processes or patterns or whatever. Um, the next thing we'll see are different types of variables. Uh, the most, what we'll be using for prototyping a lot is the letters between A to Z. 
Uh, these are global variables that are global variables that are accessible anywhere, and they're just basically for testing. Uh, the letter S is reserved for the server, the local host, which I mentioned up here. And we have also something called an environment variable, which looks like this, uh, and local variables, which are declared with the word var. Again, these are uh, not important. The distinctions are not so important right now, but it's it's a nice idea to get to get used to seeing these variables and what they they represent something else, either a number or a function. Um, this could also be, for example, a name of something, but we use words in SuperCollider to represent larger structures often. So the syntax, this coloring and the, the tilde, and also the var or var variable variable uh, declaration is sort of what, what lets us know what we can use as, as variables to um, name things. Uh, what else? The f right now, we haven't made any sound, uh, and there won't be any sound for another few minutes. Um, but the things we have in Super Collider, the, the objects we have to make sound are called unit generators, which are shortened to UGENs, and they are usually uh, blue and written with a capital letter. And this could be these could be oscillators, noise generators, filters, envelope generators, um, FFT uh, objects, for example. And we act upon these UGENs with methods, which are written after the UGEN, uh, like this, with a, a period and then the name that calls it. Um, a common one that we'll uh, encounter, for example, is a sine oscillator. And the method that we would see normally is AR, which stands for audio rate. So this would be the sample rate that your hardware is running at. There's also control rate, which uh, is what we would use if we were using it to, uh, like as an LFO, for example, controlling another um, uh, parameter somewhere. Uh, and the last one you might see, but probably not today, is IR, which is the initialization rate which means instead of polling something at the sample rate or a bit slower at the control rate, it just gets the value once and then never looks at it again. So these are different rates you can use to save resources. But today, we'll be seeing things at control rate and audio rate. Um, and methods usually have, uh, so you have a UGEN, you have a method, and then with a parentheses afterwards inside, if you on a Mac, you can press Shift, Command, Spacebar, and you'll get the arguments that you can add to these um, UGen methods. Uh, and these are things that we can change uh, in real time or as part of our composition approach uh, to change the, the, the qualities of the unit generator. So this unit generator, sine oscillator, is generating sine tone samples at the audio rate, so right now I think 48,000 times a second. Uh, but we can choose the uh, frequency. 440, for example, is the default. These are all defaults written here. I can also choose the phase. Uh, and mull and add are um, important concepts to sort of be aware of. So what I'm, what I'm going to do just briefly here is I'm going to plot a tenth of a second of this sine oscillator. So I'm, I'm just explaining this briefly for those of you who don't have any background with uh, DSP or, or synthesis or whatever. Um, a very easy way to blow your eardrums out is to uh, multiply a signal uh, beyond what's what's safe. Multiplication is essentially essentially um, amplitude control or volume control. And most unit generators in their methods have a mall argument here. Uh, and you can see with a default at one, uh, our oscillator goes from zero to one to negative one, back to zero in a full cycle. 
uh, any multiplication you do will apply to both directions, of course, uh, which is useful if you're scaling something for uh, a control rate unit generator, like a, an LFO or something. But if you're using an audio signal, it can be quite, quite damaging or dangerous. So a good thing to do is either scale things by multiplying them outside the, uh, the unit, rater, unit, unit generator, for example, or entering it as an argument, like this, for example. Um, as I said before, you can also control the volume down here. Uh, the other thing is the add argument, which comes up here as well and is in most unit generators. It's a, it's a possible argument. This is an offset from zero. So we can actually shift the whole signal if we add one to it. Instead of going from zero to one to negative one, the whole thing will go up from one to two to one, uh, sorry, to zero, and then back to one. Uh, which again is useful for control signals, but can be hard on your output, like your speakers, um, if you have uh, a unipolar signal. So uh, I, again, just mentioning these things for uh, uh, safety's sake. Uh, generally, I multiply things, I scale things down depending on what I'm working with, uh, maybe by a tenth or something, but it, it, some, some synthesis techniques will sort of be naturally louder than others. Anyways, um, yeah, when I executed this method plot on this function, uh, it actually booted the server for me. You can see it's green down here now, so I'm going to recompile the class library and, and sh sort of shut the server off. Uh, and we are going to start making sound, finally. Uh, what you can do if you're on a Mac, for example, you can press Command B as a shortcut to boot the server. You can also, um, I think there's a server menu up here, boot server. And you can also click down here, boot server. And what this does is it just turns on the sound processor. You can do a lot with Super Collider without the so sound processor. You can do um, all sorts of math functions. Uh, you can plot things that don't use unit generators. If you're, if you're plotting graphs or something, you can do that. Um, but we're interested in sound. So we'll turn on the, we'll boot the server. And now things that we write in Super Collider will go to the server and make sound. So what I can actually do, I'm just going to open up a new window here. I'm going to make another function, and I'm going to come back to our friend, the sine oscillator. Uh, I'm going to give it a frequency of 120. Uh, the phase, I'll keep the way it is, and I won't add or offset it, but I will multiply it by, uh, this is multiply, scaling the signal down to uh, 30%. Uh, and then I'm going to use the method play, whoops, with a period here. And you should have now a sine wave in your left ear. Uh, command period on a Mac to, whoops, command period on a Mac to stop the sound. Uh, what this does, this is sort of a convenience method for creating sound on Super Collider. I only use this approach of writing functions and the play method if I'm usually testing something really quickly, testing a speaker setup or, you know, bursts of pink noise. Um, but it has a lot of potential. I'm going to just show a couple quick examples of uh, the SC 140 campaign, which came out a couple of years ago. These are tweets. These were super collider code that was written with 140 characters or less. Uh, and the goal was to sort of come up with interesting pieces or compositions or, or um, sort of finding ways to sort of pare down the language to its bare minimum. So this is sort of a feedback piece by Nathaniel Virgo. And these are mostly generative pieces, which will just run forever. The whole list is on the Super Collider homepage.
that'll go on forever and also because of the way he's he's coded it will be different every time as well slightly different um, but it's just a, a nice example to show you that this um, this syntax using uh, the curly braces to make a function and then playing it dot play is perfectly legitimate you can make pieces like that but it's not very flexible we don't have access to the parameters to change things in real time or to sort of get the most out of the system it's just going to run the way it is um, although it's very nice uh, and again this is one line of code for example all right i'm going to jump in as host right now to yeah. uh, point in some comments or questions sure. just to say first that uh, with that test, some people um, got the sound in both ears, and some people got it in the left ear. And so it might have something to do with like Zoom settings or something like that. But that's just something to relay. With, with the and, first test, the sign tone or the yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then uh, I do have a question uh, sure. from uh, Molly Jones, who asks, "What makes Super Collider a more effective tool for live performance than other languages like Python?" Um. It's a good question. I, I only started working with Python in the last month, basically. So I don't know so much about the the structure, like behind the scenes, how memory is handled and things like that. Um, one of the things that's nice about Super Collider, I talked before about this language versus server um, structure. So you can actually send messages. They're just basic OSC messages. So if you learn the OSC syntax, you can actually send messages from Python to Super Collider. One of the elegant things about Super Collider are some of the built-in features, which uh, we'll look at right now, which is something, for example, like an NDEF, which stands for a node definition. Doesn't matter why it's called that, but you can uh, create a process like this one we had here and change things on the fly while it's still running. Um, Super Collider is, is very... Yeah, it manages the uh, crossfades, for example, without any, any dropouts or clicking or anything like that. Um, one of the other things really it's really great with Super Collider is multi-channel expansion. Uh, if I want to make this sine wave, um, which should have been in one ear, I'm assuming it's a zoom routing thing, if people got it in both ears. Um, but if I want to make this, for example, 120 channels instead of one, I can just expand it with this syntax. So that will now play 120, a 120 hertz sine tone in uh, 120 distinct channels. Uh, what I could also do, for example, is make a small function here and go, uh, this is a method for a range rand. So Two random, a random number between these two limits. And if I make this a function and I use that same syntax to expand it, I'll actually get 120 discrete channels with 120 discrete frequencies. So there are some little things like this that are, are unique to the language. Little, um, we call them syntactic sugar, these, these sorts of um, tips or, or, sorry, tricks or, or, um, uh, idiosyncrasies to this language which work well with audio uh, either analysis or performance or composition um, and actually if you're tired of listening to me and feel like uh, browsing the help files you can look at some of these pages which have syntactic shortcuts like I was talking about and also just basic things about operators like mathematic operators and some of these uh, control st structures like if statements, some of the things that you would find in other languages like uh, Python. Um, yeah. What I want to do first, uh, as far as making sound, is we're going to use just a sound file. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much today about signal processing or synthesis because I think that there are so many resources for those sorts of things, and um, I think a lot of people do a much better job of explaining them than, than me. Uh, but I will say that 
We'll do some granular synthesis a little bit later, which uh, Super Collider is, because of the way it's structured, it's, it's very efficient and you can do um, some pretty wild things on a per grain basis that uh, a lot of other softwares would struggle with. Um, one thing you can also keep an eye on if you're interested in comparing different languages or different softwares, down in this corner here, this is sort of our server meter. This first value is the um, CPU usage. This is our peak CPU usage. And then we have the number of unit generators running. Uh, and then these are the number of synths and groups and synth definitions, which we'll sort of learn a bit about more, but it's not so important. But if you keep an eye on these first two percentages, um, you'll see, for example, when we start running, uh, doing granular things, for example, we it, it's surprisingly efficient compared to Max or Pure Data or some of these other. Um, graphic uh, programming languages. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to make a buffer, which is something we can use to store sound in. So the server, this is S, which is that localhost variable that's already sort of default uh, for us. And I'm going to drag in uh, an audio file from my computer. Unfortunately, you don't have this one, but in the GitHub link that I posted on the first page, uh, these audio files will be there, so you could download them there if you want to. Um, and I'm just going to leave all these deep default values here. Uh, so we're just going to give it server and then the path, and I'm going to evaluate that. And now we have a buffer, and if I go uh, buffer.play, we hear a little raindrop or water drop. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is build a synth def, which is short for synthesis definition. Uh, you'll see a lot of these defs come up. It's uh, We have n defs and t defs and p defs and whatever. These are all structures that are sort of recipes. They are um, representations of a system, either a synthesizer or a pattern, something that we can modify on the fly, or we can make many instances of, many uh, iterations of, with different variations, different arguments. Uh, and since def is, for me, it was the first uh, sort of structure I learned uh, in Super Collider, and I use them all the time. Uh, you can, for example, you can do actual synthesis, or you can make synth defs, which uh, in this case, we're making one that is just playing back a buffer, so it's not doing any any hardcore uh, um, uh, signal processing. Uh, what we're going to do, first we want to decide arguments. So these are things that we want to change, want to be able to change either in performance or in uh, over several iterations. So the first thing I want to be able to change is the buffer number, which is sort of like the address of our buffer. If we had 100 buffers, 100 samples, for example, we want to be able to choose which one is which, which one we want to play back. Uh, we want to be able to choose the rate of playback, which I'm going to give it a default value of 1. Pan, we're going to say panning goes from negative 1 to positive 1, and 0 is in the center, so we're going to give it a default value of 0. Uh, amp, is, I'm going to say this is our amplitude or volume. Uh, and then I'm going to give it an out, which is the hardware output. Uh, these are all arguments that the names I've just chosen. You could call them whatever you want. Uh, but uh, sort of standard practice is to use things that you'll remember what they mean when you come back to your code a year later. Um, and arguments are things we can change from outside the synth. And variables are things that are local to the synth that we don't have any, uh, that we don't change. So SIG, our signal, is going to be a unit generator called play buff running at the audio rate. It's going to have one channel, which is the, num the number of channels of this audio file. I, I already know it has one channel. But, um, uh, and we're going to say, instead of writing in a buff num, we're going to use our argument buff num, rate argument. Uh, and I'm going to say, for now, I'm going to say loop equals 1, which means it will loop. 
uh, and it's a one channel buffer but I want it to play in two channels hopefully uh, this will play in two channels for everyone uh, and then inside this pan this is a stereo panner we're gonna put our signal the pan argument from up here and then I'm gonna put the amp argument which is level there's a few things in super collider that are weirdly inconsistent like level amp mull these things all need amplitude scaling but they're they're just used in different terminology uh, using different ter terminology in different places and unfortunately this is one of the downsides of super collider is that because it's open source and free software so many people have contributed all these great libraries and uh, objects but there's some inconsistencies in naming conventions and things like this but nothing that uh, can't be learned uh, then we have our last element in this synth def is going to be an out eugen which is just a, a bus to send to hardware uh, and inside that we're going to put our out argument default at zero and the channels array is our signal and that's it. I mean, that, that's really all we need to do. Then we add it, which means we're taking this recipe and we're putting it on the server, which means that when I send a message to the server to create one of these, it already has the recipe. It knows where to look for it. So now we see a synth def has been created. Uh, and what I can do now is I can write synth, and I give it a name. I, I use the name that I... Uh, give it the name that of the synth that I want to create and then I can make an array of arguments now if I don't put in any arguments it will just use the default arguments but because there's no default for buff num it will just play back silence so I'm gonna say buff num and the syntax here is writing the name and then the value after after a comma and the buff num is the buffer and now Flying back many uh, raindrops or water drops. This is because we have the loop uh, set to one. So I'm going to command period to stop this. Um, and if I set this to zero, for example, and evaluate send, I, I add this synth to the server again, and I run, I make an instance of the synth. We just get it to playback once. But an interesting thing to note is there's sort of uh, we call sort of a garbage collection thing that you have to be aware of is we have the synth that we just made is still here and uh, this is on the server it's in sort of saved in memory a little bit um, and if I make another one and I look at the server's node tree again I see it's still here uh, and this isn't a problem now but if we're doing granular synthesis and we're making a thousand grains a second pretty soon we're gonna run out of memory because it's the server is is holding on to these things these these sort of old memories of the synth so one of the things we have in super collider is a done action which means uh, if we want something to end and then sort of forget about it and move on uh, we can set the done action to two uh, and it will clear this um, this node tree, sort of freeing up memory for more synths in the future. So now that synth is gone, and I can do this as many times, and there's still everything's clean over here. Not an important concept for today, but something you'll see a lot in, in um, envelope generators, for example. Having a done action of two is sort of freeing up memory uh, when the envelope has ended. If you've finished your synth sound or buffer playback that'll free up some memory so now we have one fantastic sound uh, and if I want to play with some of the parameters some of these arguments I can say play back at half speed uh, I can say pan it to one channel or one side or the other side I can use some of the mathematical methods that we talked about earlier, these operators, and I can say, for example, 1 ran 2. This is a bipolar, uh, I'm going to make it a floating point. This is a bipolar random. So it'll choose random values between positive 1, negative 1, and now it's a floating value, so all the, all the little gradients in between. So if I play this back, it should be bouncing around a little bit. 
I can also do that uh, range random with our playback rate. So now we have water droplets bouncing around. Uh, and one of the things I can also do is, uh, I mean, it's not very practical to be always hammering command enter to, to play back all these, these buffers. So what I can do is I can put them inside a routine. Uh, I'm gonna, just going to code this really quickly. But basically, I'm making a function um, that will, I don't know if I can actually do this and talk at the same time. Uh, so right now, I'm making uh, a function that will run on a clock internally. This is sort of a convenience method. This fork is a convenience method. What it's doing, it's saying, play four of these synths and wait one second in between each playing them. And maybe I'll make it. We don't have to be here all, all day. So now it's choosing random values for each of these. Um, but again, this is, this is something I use for uh, maybe testing things. You might use it for, for internal functions that you want to run, but for making bigger compositions, it's maybe not so practical. But it's a very nice tool to, to test things or um, to maybe generate some material. Um, but what we're going to look at now is, I think, uh, before we get there, I'm just going to say there's these are some help files that uh, are worth looking at if you want to go deeper into synth definitions and synths. Um, but the next thing we'll look at, we'll look at patterns now. So the pattern library is perhaps the most impressive part of Super Collider, depending on what your um, what your what you plan to use Super Collider for. I think, I think patterns, the way patterns are structured in Super Collider is um, essentially like the world's most complex and sophisticated sequencer. Um, some basic concepts, if we use the letter P to say, this is a, all the pattern classes start with the letter P. So this is a P seek, P sequence. And inside that I'm gonna make an array of values. So let's just say zero, one, two, and then how many times do I want to run through this sequence? Let's say twice. Great. We have P. Our P is now a P sequence, this variable P. So now I'm going to say the letter A is P as a stream. This is like we have streams and patterns. Uh, they're slightly different, but kind of the same. The routines are also similar, but you don't have to worry about that now. And then what I can do is if I make it a stream, I can call, whoops, I can call next on this pattern. And it will give me 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. And then it will start outputting nils because it's reached the end of this pattern. One of the cool things about patterns is that this letter P is, uh, it's sort of an abstraction of what the pattern is. It is not the pattern itself. So what I can do is I can say this pattern again, and I can say B equals P as stream. And now I have two different iterations of that first pattern. So if I go uh, A next, and I go zero, one. If I go B, whoops, B next, it will start at zero. Uh, this lets you do some pretty interesting things. For example, you can start with small amounts of uh, small patterns, chain them together, put them inside each other, and then actually have them running in different streams, sometimes you know at different speeds. Uh, the basic way to control patterns is with what we call a P bind. You're going to get so sick and tired of me hear, hearing me say the letter P. P binds are binding keys and values. So a key is like a name. So a common one is dir for duration. This is a default value that is already built into Super Collider. And if you go to the help uh, file for event, at the bottom, way at the bottom, we have a list of some of these default values. There's a whole list of, uh, these are sort of traditional Western music uh, default values like uh, tempo, for example, 
um, and sort of tempered scale type uh, terminology, degree scale root, for example. Uh, but if we say in a p-bind, I have a duration, I'm going to set the duration to 1, and then I'm going to play this. And it has a, Super Glider has a built-in default instrument, which sounds, as you can tell, super lovely. Uh, you, can, you can reset it if you want to, but uh, this is what we have for now. Uh, but right now with this p-bind, it's playing, the duration is set to 1, so every one time a second it's going to output a middle C, I think, is the default note. I'm going to stop this and, whoops, and we can, one of the um, frustrating things about p-binds is that you can't change them once they're made, so the default is for this to play one time a second for infinitely long time. Uh, which isn't very useful for us, so to be able to control a p-bind and the parameters inside, like we did with our synth def, we have something called a p-def, pattern definition. And this is something that we give a name, so I'm going to call this uh, melody, let's say. And then I'm going to put a p-bind inside of it. And I'm just going to separate this a bit to make it hopefully a bit more, a bit easier to read. So we can put, for example, this dur1 in here and play it. And now it's going to play for eternity. But now what we can do is we can actually change the values in the pdef and it will just update the pattern. It will overwrite the old uh, instructions I gave it. So I'm going to give it this pattern actually. Uh, but instead of one, zero, one, and two, I'm going to say um, 0 0.5 and one, and we'll play it twice. Now we changed our rhythm, that's nice. And it plays twice and then it's done. And we have the, if we want things to play forever, we have infinity as an object we can use. Uh, and now I'm just going to code a little bit just to show you some of the things we can do with just the default settings uh, in SuperCollider, uh, the default event values. So these are things that will apply to, they're like the arguments of the default synth def, which is included, uh, comes for free in the software, like everything else. So I'm going to change the degree, uh, which is like the scale degree, and I'm going to make it a PRAND which is going to choose between, randomly, it's going to choose between the degrees 0, 1, 2, and 3, let's say. Uh, and you'll notice that, actually I'll make it 0, 1, 2, and you'll notice that our duration pattern has two steps, and our degree pattern has three steps, so they will actually uh, go out of phase with each other. So, and even though this is, this is randomly, maybe it's easier to tell if they're both in sequence. We also have, um, for example, the scale. So right now I think the default is a major scale. But we can go scale. Uh, minor, for example. That's brave. So you heard there was a bit of overlap there with the um, events. I haven't quantized, you can quantize all these patterns of course, which I haven't done, uh, but then you won't get overlap like that. But every time I update the pattern, it sort of starts at the beginning of the pattern, so that's why there's some overlap. But I'll show you a way pretty soon how to overcome that. Um, we also have sustain, whoops, which is sort of the length of the note, let's say. And right now, for example, you can use fixed values like this. It will be uh, the same every time. Just like P uh, the P sequence, for example, you can uh, use one value and do it an infinite number of times. An important principle of patterns is that the pattern will last as long as the shortest pattern. 
So if I make this one beat long, or one instance long, the pattern stops. So that's often why it happens all the time. If you're making huge patterns, sometimes one of them is only 10 steps, and one of them is everything else is infinity, and then suddenly it stops, and you don't know why. Uh, some of the cool things you can do with patterns, they're pattern, these pattern classes, there's, I don't know, dozens of them. Uh, we can choose, for example, P, X, Rand, which will randomly choose from all the values, but it will never repeat a value before it starts the, before it starts going through them again. So each of these values will be chosen randomly, but each of them will be chosen exactly one time and before it repeats again. Uh, we have something, if we make a pan argument, uh, we have, let's try this, we have something called p key, which is pretty cool. It takes the value from another key in the pattern and uses that as the value for this. So what I mean is if I go p key dir and I make this random, the durations are going to be half a second long or one second long, but when they're one second long, they're going to be in the right channel, and when they're half a second long, they're going to be... Maybe I'll make this a bit... Uh, well, it should pan a bit forward, but... It's slightly discernible, but uh, what we could do is we could map it linear from a linear values... Mapping from... Uh, sorry from a linear scale to a linear scale. And I can go 0 0.5 to 1, mapping to minus 1 uh, and 1. So now we get a bit more of a ping pong thing. And this is randomly, this is happening within the pattern. Uh, I could make this uh, 0 0.75, for example. And now we have three duration values, and the pan argument is being changed as a result of the random, randomly chosen duration value. Uh, and this is why I get so excited about this pattern library, because you can share data between multiple patterns as well. You can have a master pattern that controls all these random processes. Um, I'll do you one better, and I'm gonna make... Okay, I'm gonna choose random values, we're gonna choose random values here, and instead of P key, I'm going to comment this line out so you can play around with it if you want. And I'm going to make another pan argument, which is P if. So this is, it sort of, at each uh, call of the pattern, it asks a question. And in this case, the question is going to be P key again. Whoops. P key of the degree uh, argument, degree, degree key. If it's even, this is the method to make it to uh, declare whether it's a true or false statement that it's an even number. If it's even, pan it to the negative one. If it's odd, pan it to positive one. So now we'll get extreme left right. So things like this, like the P if or P key, you can. Uh, especially with PIF and there's P while some other familiar conditional statements that you can include in these patterns. Uh, you can basically write whatever you want as a, as a function and it will update it, realize it in real time. Uh, one thing I'm going to do really quickly is show you how to, you can control this uh, pattern definition from the outside so I can say stop and it will stop. I can make it play, and I can also make it a crossfade, for example. So let's say in four beats, now in this case, beats are related to a clock, which is by default the tempo clock, uh, which runs at a default tempo of one time a second, or 60 beats per minute. Uh, so that's 60 for 60. If I want to make it faster, I can change the values here in the duration argument, or I can change the tempo clock and scale everything. Uh, 
And if I, for example, set a fade time for four beats, this will be four beats in relation to the tempo clock. And say I want, instead of those rhythms, I just want every rhythm, I want every uh, instance to happen a quarter of a second apart. It's hard to tell with these sounds, but there's a bit of crossfade happening. In the next example, I'll show you, the, it's much more apparent, the crossfade. Uh, here are, I feel like I'm, the next example I really want to show you, so I'm, I'm going to sort of blast through the next bit, but here are some relevant help files to the pattern library, or the pattern, um, uh, yeah, the pattern library in Super Collider. You have also something, the JITLib, which is the just-in-time library for live coding, which involves patterns. This is the way I was just coding now is the way some people, um, variations of this are, are very useful for live coding. What, what we're going to look at now is combining playing back sound files, which we did first, and then using the pattern library. Uh, to make something hopefully interesting. Uh, this is sort of a granular, well it is, it's a granular synthesis approach. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make um, a buffer. And I'm moving fast now just to sort of make sure we get through this. But uh, like I said, all these, all the code will be posted at my GitHub, which I will share the link to again. I think it's in the chat, but I'll put it in the Facebook account, uh, Facebook page as well. This I know is a stereo file, uh, but what I'm gonna do is just read one channel of it. So I'm gonna go channels, and I'm just gonna read the first channel, the left channel. So now we have this. This may or may not be a familiar excerpt for some people. heard it before, I'm sure. Uh, and now instead of writing out a synthdef, I'm just going to copy and paste one for the time's sake. But what we have here is the same playback buffer that we had before. Uh, and we had, now I've added an envelope generator, which controls the, essentially it's a, controls the volume. Uh, of of the playback. Instead of playing back the whole sound file, we're just going to play a grain in the shape of a sine wave, uh, which actually you can go env.sine.plot and we're going to play grains of sound with this shape. Uh, and this is where the done action comes becomes very important. Uh, I'm going to turn the loop off here. Uh, one of the things Super Collider, one of the cool things about Super Collider that I think is super cool is that it has built-in methods so that if I change the buffer, if I change the sound sample we're using while we're doing granular synthesis, things like buff frames and buff rate scale will change the internal math to accommodate different sample rates and different buffer lengths. So I've made something called frames, a variable called frames, which is all the frames in the buffer, all the samples, uh, minus one because they start from zero. Uh, and now I'm saying the starting position of our grains is going to be frames, so all the frames times position, this argument position. And position now can just be a value between zero and one. So if I say zero, it means we're starting at the beginning, and one is all the frames. And this helps with a bit of the math. Um, and then the rate as well is scaled so that this, if I'm if I have a recording at 48k in kilohertz, uh, I can drop it in here and play, and then I can switch it to something that was recorded at 96 or 44.1, and it will accommodate me. Uh, so now, just to test this, I'm going to copy and paste again. Load this synthdef, and we're going to play one grain. That's a nice sounding grain. Uh, and that would play a random grain at different parts in the in the buffer. Yeah, that's working. That's nice. Now what we're going to do is we're going to combine this with our pattern approach that we just looked at. 
And one of the cool things about Super Collider, this th or this workflow in Super Collider, is that you have synth defs, which you can make yourself. There's the default synth def, which sounds terrible, but you can make your own synth, de synth defs, which can play back sound, or they can also be complex synthesis uh, procedures. And if you have your own synth def, at the beginning of your P bind, you just have to write instrument grain playback. And now all of these keys that we were looking at before are arguments that we can change with other patterns. So maybe the first thing I'll do is I'll get rid of all this. Uh, and we'll just use the default values. I'm going to make the grain durations half a second. And I'm going to say, uh, once a second, play back this grain. Oh, and it needs. Right now, it's starting from the beginning of the sound file, which is the position argument, which is silence, I think. Oops, and I need a comma here. And I'm maybe going to make it a little bit louder. Uh, oh, another comma. So now it's playing back the same grain, same rhythm, same place in the in the buffer. Uh, and this is where we can do some really interesting things with our uh, pattern classes, pattern objects. So for example, um, let's see if we can, I'm trying to think of where to go. There's, there's a lot of places we can go. First thing we'll do is we'll change the position argument. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a bit of noise to this. We're going to try a granular freeze sort of thing. So this is white noise. Uh, so random values between whatever uh, limits I want. So I'm going to say 001, 003. And this is going to choose the position in the buffer is going to be halfway through plus a little bit of noise. And I'm going to increase the playback to um, the playback frequency to four times a second. So now we're starting to get a bit of a smear thing happening. I can increase the playback, maybe even more. Okay. Now maybe we'll try moving the position marker from the beginning of the of the sound file. So we're going to say P series, and we're going to move from uh, 0 0.1, because I think there's a bit of silence at the beginning, and we're going to move in steps. So we're starting at 0 0.1. We're going to move in steps of very small amount, uh, an infinite amount of times, and then add to it a little bit of noise, just so we don't get any comb filtering and whatnot. Now you can hear it slowly moving through uh, through the buffer. One of the things I'm going to add here is whoops, a pan argument with something called pseg, which is essentially an envelope. So we're going to make this pan argument go from negative 1 to 1 and back to negative 1 in a span of 10 seconds. This can also be a pattern, by the way. So it could be 10 seconds the first time, or a random number every time. It's going to be a linear route, and it's going to happen every time I update. One of the things I said before is about changing these values in real time. So right now, every time I evaluate the whole PDEF, it starts at the beginning. So it starts at the beginning of the recording. There are a couple ways to do this, but one way to change the values in real time is to do something called a p bind def, which is a combination of a p bind and a p def. Doesn't really matter. But we use the same name, Grainer. And now we can change the arguments one by one. So I'm going to make the grain duration smaller. 
Oh, that should have started from the middle. For some, oh. for some reason, I I might have to check the help file again about this, but uh, you should be able to use this to update um, individual arguments in real time without starting at the beginning of the file. That worked that time. Uh, I may have to give it a name or something up here. But you can, for example, update, let's say, amp. That's very quiet suddenly. And again, this is the way that. Uh, this is one way, for example, you can do live coding. Uh, the last slide that I, I don't know if we have so much time for, but I'm gonna... Okay, just before you move on to the last slide, yeah. Mike, I will interrupt yeah. again as yeah, host please. and relay questions. This seems like a good time to do it. Um, I think you sort of were addressing this in just in those last moments, but um, Molly Jones again is asking, um, can you eliminate the default smoothing of grains? And then a second question is, how do you access other devices from Super Collider? Yeah, so there's no default smoothing here. This is like overlap, for example, is just, uh, it's based on the math uh, in this particular case. So um, I'm adding a bit of noise. Those are just values that I kind of chose randomly. Um, and like uh, grain frequency, which I kind of just chose randomly. You do have, for example, um, T grains, which is a UGen specifically ba based, uh, made for granular synthesis. And in there, I think you can choose, there's an argument for overlap. Um, uh, but yeah, everything, I, I would say, it's perhaps a bit bold, but I would say that everything is customizable or, um, Modifiable in Super Collider. If you want to, you can write your own classes. You can write, you can write, rewrite, or change the source code. Um, it's an open source project, so it's very much encouraged. There's a lot of custom libraries to do these things. There's some, um, for example, in the here are some more help files about granular synthesis. Uh, this, these are all granular uh, classes for certain things. And then there's also some tutorials on granulation and how to do it in Super Collider, uh, written by Daniel Meyer, who's fantastic and very thorough in his explanations. Interfacing Super Collider with other, um, I'm assuming like hardware MIDI controllers, for example, is I'm assuming what the question was about. Um, true to form, we have something called a MIDI def. Uh, we also have OSC defs. I have a monom controller that I use all the time, which is an o sends OSC messages. So I use an OSC def, and inside that you write a function. Same same format as these things. You give it a name, my OSC def, then you write a function, and it you decide how you want to parse the information. Same with MIDI def. Um, any yeah. The other, that's, that's hardware interfacing. If you want to interface with uh, software, for example, there are, um, like I said, OSC, it speaks the language of OSC. So if you send OSC messages from Python or whatever else you want, uh, you can do that very easily. The last thing I was going to show is these, the pattern class, for example, the pattern classes, the pattern approach is just one of many ways of using Super Collider. Uh, but it's you can make whole compositions like this, or you can also just generate a bunch of algorithmic material, and then later take it to a DAW and, and sort of do some post production. Uh, Super Collider. If we go down here to this meter, if I go start recording, it will start recording. 
Uh, and you can also set, if we go to the, I think it's recorder, you can set all the, um, for example, the number of channels you want to record. I think I've recorded 32 channel files, no problem. Um, you can uh, specify where you want, for example, uh, the path, yeah, where you want to send your recordings when they're done. There are default paths and everything. Uh, so if you choose record here, it will just send it to the default um, folder. But the last thing I'll show very quickly, and this I'm just going to copy and paste, but it will be on the GitHub, as I said before. Uh, that's what I was talking about now, recording in real time using this. But if you want to record in not real time, uh, you can make what's called a score. And if I quickly turn this short little p-bind into a score and post the what's inside of it, we get four seconds of OSC messages. These are the times, and these are the messages. Uh, and this is what the pattern is actually sending um, to create the pattern information. I don't use this method a whole lot, so uh, there's everything that's here is basically a trimmed down version of what's in these help files, non-real-time synthesis and the score help file. But basically if I run this um, little script here, you have a pattern which plays for 10 seconds as a score, these messages, and then we record the pattern to this location, sample rate, header format, for example. You can choose how many channels you want uh, and it works. You can you can try it yourself, but this is from the the NRT the non real time synthesis uh, help file, uh, and it's a nice way if you're doing big compositions or if you're working with like analysis, for example, like you want to analyze a big buffer, uh, but you don't want to have to sit and listen through ten minutes of um, scratch tones on a violin. You can make a synth def that does the FFT analysis, for example, and then. Uh, do it all in non-real time, and it's very efficient and very fast. Um, yeah, I want to leave a bit of time, a bit of time for questions, so I will wrap it up there. Thanks for uh, listening so far. I hope some of it stuck. I hope some of it was inspiring, uh, but I'm definitely keen to answer any questions you might have about uh, anything really. Right. Any questions? So, like the question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I should say also, I I use this software. Um, I've sort of been building an interactive, interactive improvising system akin to George Lewis's Voyager. Um, I have. I've built one entirely in Super Collider, which does real-time analysis, and then is sort of an artificially intelligent system that makes decisions about how to interact with performers, and that's all done in Super Collider. Um, using some third-party plugins, but mostly just like the in-house analysis tools, which are pretty good. Um, I, yeah, I've also, like I said, I have a Monom controller, which I have built a system for with a graphic interface, all of that you can do graphic interfaces in Super Collider. It's not as sexy as Max, but it it's very functional. Um. Ah, we have a question now uh, from Simon Couvis-Sirois, and it's uh, could you talk a bit about your work, uh, Super Collider Journal Number One? How does it work? Yeah. So uh, for those of you, thanks. I'm glad somebody checked it out. Uh, I posted a video in the Facebook event, uh, which uh, I made in the fall. Again, pretty much all of that is made in Super Collider. And what I, I can actually just open it up. Uh, let's see here. Um, it's, a, it's a piece that's sort of structured as a text document where I write text and the text triggers animations or sounds or, or whatever. 
So what I did, this is my workflow. I made a few, um, these are buffers being loaded, samples basically in a library. Set the tempo where I wanted it to. I loaded a bunch of synth definitions like we talked about before. And then I made a bunch of patterns. Then I made a bunch of functions. Uh, and these are things that pop up uh, graphic windows or um, yeah, these play uh, recordings. You can also uh, execute uh, shell commands from Super Collider using something called pipe. So I use this pipe object to open up videos on my desktop or open up web pages or you know, open up other software. I also used it to access the built-in speech synthesizer on MacBooks, which is pretty hilarious. Uh, and then uh, what I did is um, you have a, an object called document, which uh, is the actual text document that you're writing in. And I made a function so that every time a key down action happened, every time I pressed a key, it would record the Unicode value. And then those Unicode values, so exam for example, when I write the word performance, it triggers, turns on this PDEF. So let's, I can actually run this. And if I go, uh, oh, let me try this again. Yeah, so if I go, uh, I'm excited about this, whoops, this performance. And this is actually like an array manipulation, so it takes the array of um, Unicode numbers and then it matches it to another pattern. And then the thing to turn it off was direction. Let's go in a di different direction. So this is sort of what I, uh, the SC journal piece and the ones I'm going to be continuing to make are ways to sort of find non-traditional, it's an effort to make sort of non-traditional, find non-traditional ways of using Super Collider. So this is kind of like a live coding technique, but it's, it's not really like a standard live coding technique. Um, and looking at this now, I could have made it a lot more cleaner and nicer and uh, but yeah that's one one way of making a piece in super collider but this this workflow of making synth definitions making patterns or routines which are kind of like patterns uh, this is a very common workflow um, and then of course I had like a script on the side which I was typing which I had to make sure to stay to the script or it would trigger wrong things at the wrong time and whatever Are there any other questions? Any other questions? I should say also, I forgot to say this, but if you go to the, um, if we go to the sign oscillator help file, there are snippets of code here which you can actually run in the help window which is really nice um, and pretty much all the files for example the granular file tutorials have that as well so you can uh, either copy paste from there and run it in super collider or just run it directly in the help file and that's for me learning the software before there were like video tutorials I would just copy and paste things and change the numbers and you know try to keep the volume down and not blow my ears out um, yeah Hopefully some of the code that I wrote today, you can sort of take some of the pattern stuff, for example, you can change some numbers, explore some of the pattern classes and find, find something interesting, I'm sure. Okay, well, with that, I will uh, relay a final comment to you, Mike, that uh, sure. Sadi wrote that you should slap a voice recognition on this, be fun. Uh, and apart from that, I just want to thank everyone for attending. Merci de venir uh, um, and to thank Mike for presenting and for sharing all this wonderful knowledge and say that um, this uh, webinar series that has been ongoing has been in a weekly format up until now because we're now switching to a monthly format 
Alors, la prochaine, c'est le 8 juillet avec uh, Samuel Shahi. The next session is going to be on the 8th of July with Samuel Shahi. And it will be about uh, grant writing. So uh, you're welcome to join us there if you want to learn more about writing grants uh, in the Canadian system. And otherwise, uh, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.